Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Minecraft Disney World Q&A. This is the series in which you guys send me all manner of Disney questions, whether it's about the parks or the animations or the company or the people themselves, and I try to give you the answers to the best of my ability, even though sometimes the answers, I don't know. Uh, anyway, we're here on MC Magic, the 1d1 scale uh, recreation of Walt Disney World. We're here at the Polynesian Resort. We're going to wander around a little bit, uh, and then I'm going to answer some of your questions. I've got a bunch of great ones here today, and let's just go ahead and dive right in. So the first question comes from Devin on Minecraft, who asks, Hey Rob, what do you think about the new community in Disney World where you can live in Disney? Do you think they are overpricing it by selling the cheapest house for $1.6 million? Thanks and have a magical day. You, of course, are talking about this new uh, housing complex in Disney on Disney property. Um, of course, now the name's escaping me. All right, uh, it's Golden Oak. So Golden Oak is a community on Disney property. You can buy homes. Uh, they are extremely expensive homes, but if you go to their website, they are also extremely beautiful homes. Uh, do I think they're overpricing it? Probably not. I imagine those houses will all get bought up pretty quickly and they will run out before they even know what to do with it. And so, I mean, obviously 1.6 million, that's that's a lot for a house um, anywhere, really. Um, but I think the reason that they can get away with that is because they, you know, it's all about location, location, location. And, and Disney World property is some pretty highly regarded, lo uh, you know, property. So, um it's, it's pretty clearly, um, they're kind of pricing it that way because they can. I think the houses totally meet that level of quality. You know, they're not just like norm, normal run-of-the-hill houses. They are, you know, virtually, you know, Disney mansions. Uh, I would love to own one of those one day. But, you know, uh, I need a little bit more money to do that. Uh, but I think coming down to it, I don't think it's that they're overpricing it. It's it's sort of like that's how a market works. They can price it at whatever they think it'll sell at, and I think these houses will definitely sell at those numbers. Uh, and if they did like super cheaper houses, you know, that are just sort of more on you know our level, uh, they would also just get totally grabbed up instantly. And you know, either way, whether it's due to supply and demand or pricing it'll be incredibly hard for anybody to sort of secure a home on Disney property, but what a dream if you could, right? These are also really cool, these little houses on the water. Look at these, nice little rooms, great view. Look at that, so nice. Uh, our next question comes from the Disney Expert 408. Okay, this one's a long one, so let me just jump into it. I just wanted to say that I remember when I was little, I was a huge fan of Snow White and I dressed up as her when I went to Disney once and all I wanted to do was meet her. We looked around all day and couldn't find her anywhere. Finally, my mom asked Jasmine if she knew where Snow White was and she told us to hold on a second. She came out of the back room with Snow White and even though it was such a long time ago, I clearly remembered how excited I was when I saw her. Not only that, uh, but the evil queen also came out while I was talking to her and we had a whole conversation. And after we took a picture together, they went back into the back room and didn't talk to anyone else. It was the most special and magical thing that has ever happened to me, even now, just to know that they came out to specially talk to me and me alone. Have you ever witnessed anything like this at Disney, or have it happened to you? What are your thoughts on the specialness, and how many people do you think come back to the park space second experiences like this? So that's a great little story. Uh, it's very touching. I can't say I've ever seen that sort of thing happen uh, firsthand, but I've heard so many stories similar to it. Um, to answer your question as to what are my thoughts on the specialness, I think that's what sets Disney apart from other companies. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of people will ask me, you know, what would Walt think of the parks? And there's no way to truly know. He's been gone for so long. But I would like to imagine he'd still be happy with the fact that despite how large of a corporation this, this Disney company has become, they still stick to that idea of treating guests as well as possible. In fact, you know, his business strategy with Disney all along was if you bend over backwards to make the experience as good of an experience for the guest, you'll earn a customer for life. And so it's not only makes a better experience for them, but it also, you know, is a good business decision for you, which is why I think they do that. And I think it's really fantastic. And I think um, maybe there aren't a lot of people who would go back to Disney just for that one specific thing. But I think having cast members who really stick to that uh, Disney quality level of uh, uh, of 
treating a guest well on a regular basis adds up to one of the reasons why absolutely people come back to Disney is because, you know, personally, now that I'm older and I'm the kind of, I'm the person who's deciding where I go on vacation, right? It used to be a family thing and it's where the family decided to go. But now I could go wherever I want, you know, as long as I can, you know, make it happen. And I consistently come back to Disney because I know for a fact I will have a good time. And I know, and a large part of that is because the cast members will always go the extra mile to sort of make it a good time. So I'm very grateful that the cast members are dedicated to that. And I absolutely think that that lends itself to the popularity of why Disney's become such a memorable vacation spot. Our next question comes from Jakey Juren, who asks, Firstly, I've sent you a power request on Decot. Thank you. Um... Do you think Walt would be mad because of all the park and no city, and also because he was a very American, do you think he'd be annoyed with the non-US parks? Finally, what is your favorite park icon? Thanks. So, easy question first, Spaceship Earth, my favorite park icon, just for everything it represents and just the idea of the Spaceship Earth, um, the story that Ray Bradbury wrote for that ride. Uh, Go to your other questions. Do I think you'd be mad because of all the parks and none of the um, city? No. He wasn't opposed to there being more parks. It's just he wasn't invested personally in putting more parks out there. You know, to him, he would prove something and, you know, prove that it could be done well and then let other people take over while he moves on to the next thing. You know, just because he went from animated film to live action film doesn't mean the animated film stopped. There were still more of them. And he wasn't angry that there were more animated films after Snow White. He just wasn't as involved as he was with Snow White, which was pioneering it. So... I don't think he'd be upset that there are more theme parks. Uh, I, I think he'd probably be disappointed that there was no city, though I I would think that anybody who took a look at what he wanted to do with Epcot and then took a look at the world today would realize that the Epcot he wanted to create just wasn't feasible and it wasn't going to work out the way our world sort of evolved. And there's no way for him to have known that because it was you know way back in the 60s. But just the way companies work and technology works, it just wouldn't have worked out. And I, hopefully he would have seen that and, you know, sort of been understanding of that fact. As to your other question, I don't think he would have been annoyed at all with the non-U.S. parks. You know, he was a very patriotic person. He was very big about America and he was very proud to be American. But that I don't think extended into a dislike or a hatred or anything like that for other countries you know he would go on tours to Europe all the time whether it's for vacation or for work you know they work to make sure that their animations are in as many countries as possible um he I remember when he did the South American tour uh I think it was like after World War II when they were like putting the Panama Canal in and and that's sort of where the three caballeros came from so he loves different cultures or he loved different cultures and um oh the secret's out he's still around no uh he he loved different cultures and different countries and um you know even though Epcot wasn't a theme park when he was planning it there were all these talks about you know this sort of World's Fair, 24-7 World's Fair, and he was a big fan of the World's Fair, which was a celebration of all these different nations. So yeah, I absolutely don't think he would have been upset at all with the fact that there are parks outside of the U.S. I think, um, you know, it's not mutually exclusive for him to love America and then, you know, like other countries as well. You know, he could do both, and I guess he did. (laughs) Uh, Next question comes from... Matt, 5676, this is the most interesting question of the week. Ding, ding, ding. You win the most interesting question of the week award. He asks, hey, Rob, a question for your Q&A. Do you know why Walt's last words were Kurt Russell? So this is an interesting one, and it took a little research. So there's this myth that goes around that his last words before he died were Kurt Russell. This is an incorrect myth. Nobody knows what his last words were. One of the last things he's written in his office before he was uh, hospital bound and then eventually passed away was the name Kurt Russell. Now, Kurt Russell at the time was a young child actor. Now he's, you know, an adult actor, uh, bordering on an older person actor. Uh, But he had worked on Disney films in the past. And if you look at um, when they went in and looked at his office after he passed away, there was a note with some like a paper with some notes on it. And one of them, I think it was the third or fourth note down was just the name Kurt Russell. And of course, a lot of urban legends and myths popped up as to why he would be thinking about Kurt Russell like right towards the end of his days. 
Uh, but the, the most common answer is with a lot of these myth stories and, and legends, it's usually the most boring answer, which is that uh, Kurt Russell at that point had been working on projects at Disney, and so likely he had Kurt Russell in mind for another project that he was working on. You know, he was always thinking about projects in the future, so odds are, you know, he was thinking of who to cast for a certain role in a film, and he thought of Kurt Russell, so he wrote it down to remind himself, and then, you know, unfortunately never got to follow through with that because then he was, you know, sent to the hospital where he passed away, so... You know, his last words, it wasn't like a rosebud sort of situation where, you know, he mysteriously said Kurt Russell and then died. And what does that mean? It was just, uh, I think just when you have a character who is as large and famous and memorable as Walt, I think there will always be people who will look very deeply into everything that that person does. And sometimes there isn't a lot of depth to what some people do. Even famous people at times will just scribble down notes, you know? Uh, but a very interesting question, none the least. Uh, very, very interesting. <laughs> Our next question comes from Devin on Minecraft again, who asks, What are your thoughts on Disney Infinity 2.0? Do you think they're going overboard with two Marvel playsets and 20 Marvel characters plus 40 Marvel power discs? Uh, no, I don't think they are. What do I think about uh, in Disney Infinity 2.0? I think we need to see what the game disc offers that makes it worth buying a whole other game. You know, they tried to sell Disney as Disney Infinity as a platform, which I love. I love the fact that I could plug in my power pad. I don't need a new power pad. I could use all these characters from the last one. It's not like I have to rebuy anything. Um, and the customizability and the expansion of that game is entirely in my hands. You know, it, I don't think it's overboard to make 40 power discs and 20 characters and two play sets. Cause at the end of the day, I don't, I could buy as many or as little as that as I want, you know, maybe I only want two play discs or maybe I only want one play set and I could buy it and still totally enjoy the game. I don't need to have all of that to have like the full experience. So as long as that remains the case, I think there's no problem going overboard, quote unquote. Uh, it, the problem pops in where it's like, well, you know, in order to make the game work, you need both play sets and, you know, 10 of the characters or something like that. Because then now you're asking a lot uh, financially from players. But I'm excited to see how it looks. I'm glad they're moving it on to the next generation. Uh, my Xbox 360 is in my closet. I packed it away because the generation's over. That would have been the only game I ever really would have played. And I felt like it wasn't worth keeping out just for that. So the idea that I can now buy this 2.0 for... Uh, PS4 and get back into playing some Disney Infinity, I'm all for it. And honestly, whether I decide to play the game or not again, I am buying that Captain America figurine just to have it because it looks awesome and Captain America is one of my favorite heroes. So it'll be great. Uh, next question comes from Snowgirl1069 who asks, I have a question about animatronics. As you probably know, there are many different animatronics that either don't work at all or partially work. Rides such as Splash Mountain and even the Yeti at Expedition Everest. Do you think it's important for Disney to fix things like this and in turn close down the rides for long periods of time? Or do you think that it's not important enough because not enough people notice the animatronics aren't working in the first place? Thanks. Uh, it's a great question, and I think the answer varies a lot depending on the ride you're talking about. Uh, Expedition Everest is a great example. It's got the big Yeti in it, and when you ride it, the Yeti reaches out and swings at you, or is supposed to, and it's really scary and awesome, and I was lucky enough to go on Expedition Everest while that was the case, and it was one of the few times I've genuinely screamed on a ride. Uh, but unfortunately, the way it was designed, it's actually damaging the uh, base of the structure of Expedition Everest whenever it moved, so they had to turn it off. And... From what I've heard, in order to repair it properly so that, you know, it works again and doesn't damage the ride, it would require essentially doing a major overhaul to the ride and closing it down for a long time. In cases like that, I think they really have to look at it and go, well, does the Animal Kingdom have enough to carry the weight of losing Expedition Everest for months or even a year? And I think right now that answer is no. I think maybe when Pandora opens up, it'll be yes, and it'll be, you know, there'll be more stuff out there and they could take the risk of closing it down for a while i think that's really what it boils down to as a company is you know is there something there to pick up that that slack when that ride's closed as for more minor ones i've always been in the camp of like why don't you just fix it over the nights like even if it's just a little bit out of a time but i'm not an engineer i'm not a cast member i don't know how the logistics of that sort of thing work 
Um, I certainly hope that they don't fall too often into that trend of thinking that we they'll never notice. Let's just leave it broken uh, because I think it's the attention, the detail that puts together, like I was mentioning, that magical experience that gets people to go back to Disney time and time again. All right, our next question comes from the Minecraft Warrior, who asks, what do you think of the new attraction, La Venture Totalmente Tokyo? I can't pronounce this. It's in French, and the word Remy's in it, so it's imagine it's a um, it's a Ratatouille ride opening in Disneyland Paris on July 10th. Do you think it will come to Epcot's France Pavilion? So as it sounded in my tone of voice, I actually don't know very much about this ride, and you were informed me on it, and I'm going to have to go look into it more. Um... I'm all for more new rides. I'm more in favor of rides that are based on original ideas than films, but hey, take it what you can get. Do I think it'll come to France? Never say never. It probably isn't in their plans. They probably want to gauge the success or failure of this ride and see, you know, how it would make sense to move it over there. You also have to remember that I think the country pavilions still, for the most part, work on a um, sponsorship system where, you know, the countries or in most cases companies from the countries are sponsoring it so really it's a matter of well how much would it cost to bring that ride over and can we convince a country to sort of pick up that tab and if that answer is no then they have to wonder how much is it going to cost them to move it over and are they gonna want to they might look at it and go well listen we're glad with we're happy with world showcase being what it is and leaving the rides for the future world part or they may be looking for something to expand, and that's an idea on the table. Uh, there's no way of knowing. Uh, I would definitely like to see it. I'd love to see more rides in World Showcase, but uh, only time will tell. Next question comes from Laugh-A-Lot54, who asks, What is your favorite underrated Disney movie that most people don't know about? Mine is Peach Dragon. I just rewatched it last week, and I forgot how cute it was. It's a live-action musical that has an animated dragon, and it was made in the 70s. Um, I remember Peach Dragon a little bit, too. My favorite would have to actually be some of the Disney Channel original films um, or movies made for Disney. You know, my number one favorite, I think, underrated film is Heavyweights. And I think that was um, directed by Paul Feig, who does a lot of episodes of The Office and Freaks and Geeks and stuff. And it's got Ben Stiller in it. It's got Jerry Stiller. It's got um, Keenan Thompson when he was younger. Um the guy who played Goldberg from the Mighty Ducks. It was, I remember seeing it on the Disney Channel all the time. Apparently it was in theaters at some point, but I never saw it in theaters. Uh, it was it was a really funny movie. I enjoyed it a lot. I own it today still. I, I really like watching it, but I feel like a lot of people don't remember it unless you were like, not to sound like the meme, but if you were a 90s kid, you probably, you might remember it. Uh, but outside of that, I don't think it's got the greater Disney appreciation that like something like Pete's Dragon or, or you know, Little Mermaid has. Next question, as we pull here into the Magic Kingdom, comes from Mr. Static Blitz, who asks, Do you think the future of the second golden age of Disney animated films may reach its end with Big Hero 6? After hearing news of future animated movies and the breaks they will be taking next year, 2015, and every other year now, it seems like it will be hard for Disney to top Frozen with a different movie. Now they will be releasing two animated movies every other year, Every year, no, every other year starting in 2016. Marshall McLuhan once said, All media works to works us over completely. They are so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetic, psychological, moral, ethical, and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, affected, unaffected, or unaltered. And Frozen is no exception. Ah, uh, man, that's a big question. I don't... Here's the thing, I... I wouldn't say that the, the second golden age would end with Big Hero 6 because I don't think we're technically in it yet. I think Frozen absolutely opened the door to a second Disney renaissance. And the first one being the second animation, the first animation renaissance, which came with, you know, The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and all of these great films, Aladdin, <clears throat> so on and so forth. I think Frozen allowed that opportunity to happen. And I think what we'll see after it will decide whether or not we're in a second uh, Disney renaissance before we can even consider what might end that renaissance. And uh, timing and oversaturation will definitely play a part, whether they do too much of it or not enough. I think um, that 
will heavily depend on, yeah, how much they oversaturate it. Maybe, hopefully not enough. I feel like they're doing a good job with Marvel. I think they could pull it off. It really boils down to the story. Like every film, I think it always boils down to story. And we'll have to just see what comes out next and see if this is even a renaissance. It could just be a fluke with a really great movie. And then they go back to, you know, sort of subpar films with Pixar carrying the bulk of the weight. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited to see what which one it ends up being and where it goes from there. So lastly, I've got three shorter questions that I think um, we'll call the lightning round. Uh, but first, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is leave it in the comments below. I try my best to get to as many of them as possible, if not in the video, in the comments themselves. Um, but, you know, anything Disney related, feel free to ask. If you want to follow me on Twitter and get a more, you know, instantaneous answer, you can follow me at Rob Plays. I do a bunch of other Minecraft stuff, including more Disney, th Disney videos, as well as non-Disney Minecraft stuff, like our Jurassic Park series that we're working on. Um... And then I have another channel called Rob Plays Those Games on YouTube, and that's for all non-Minecraft related Let's Plays. So, you know, Wolf Among Us, The Walking Dead, Wolfenstein, you name it, I did some walk, um, Watch Dogs. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to the lightning round. Tanya, Tanya asks, hey Rob, what is your favorite country at World Showcase and what country do you think Disney should add? Um, favorite country, Italy for the food and the theme and the style. Did I answer this one before? I think I might have answered this one before. If I answered this twice, I apologize. Country they should add, uh, Australia, uh, Oceanic. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've answered this question. Rob, you're crazy. You're not even keeping track of these questions anymore. Next one comes from I am Iron Man 21. Uh, when's your favorite? I, did I not answer all of these? My favorite time of Disney. My fa What's your favorite time of year to go to Disney World? I'm like losing my mind right now. I think I've answered all of these before. Uh, my favorite time is September. September is summer's over. It's cooling off. Everyone's back in school, so the lines are not that long. Um, and it's just super enjoyable. And it lets me get out of New York during the fall allergy season, so it gives me a little bit of rest there. And it's also during the off season, so that's usually when you see some free dining perks or some discounts. So it's, it's a way to go when you're cheaper. It's tougher if you've got kids, obviously, because they've got school and you don't want to like pull them out of school. But, you know, in my position as a 20-something person who d just has work and I could take my vacation whenever I want, well then, boom, September's perfect. And then finally, Josh Davis asks, what is your favorite backstory for a ride and why? Now, there are two ways to interpret this question. What is my favorite backstory as in the story within the ride itself? And then there's also the favorite backstory as in the story of the creation of the ride. Um... My favorite story, as in the story in the ride itself, is Spaceship Earth. It's the story of human evolution of our communication technologies and capabilities. And it shows and highlights how important that is to us as a species and where it can bring us. And it tries to put the onus of the responsibility on us directly to say, look, look at what humans have done for thousands of years to get where we are today and now here we are with this amazing technology and it's up to us to not waste it or squander it on you know babble and to really use it to usher in a renaissance and that is such an amazing message to me that is why it's probably my favorite ride and it's um I think any attraction that could be an attraction and entertaining while at the same time put across a message like message like that is really fantastic as for attractions based on, like, the making of, I'm actually a big fan of Captain EO, despite the fact that I've never actually been on the attraction, and I've never seen it, and I'm not even a huge Michael Jackson fan. But every time I read about attractions, I always find it interesting how, you know, it was at a point where Michael Eisner was just sort of growing the Disney parks, and this was something they wanted to try, is to get big names attached to these rides, and... They got, you know, Coppola and Lucas involved and then Michael Jackson and, you know, ILM and it went way over budget. And it's, it's sort of an interesting story of just how it was an experiment for the Disney company that at the time proved to not be worth it. But, you know, now we have Captain EO came back when Michael Jackson passed away. So it's, it's obviously got a nostalgia involved there. Anyway, that, that Mickey sound means I'm starving. I got to run and grab some food. I want to thank you all for joining me this week. Thank you for your questions. Um, I hope you all have a fantastic week. Whatever you're doing, make the most of it because it makes it so much better. And I hope to see you all next time for the next 
Minecraft Disney Q&A. Bye, everybody.